Thank you again to the Canadian Media Producers Association for presenting this session. Before passing things off to our moderator, I'd like to briefly introduce today's speakers. And if you'd like to learn anything more about any of them, we will include a link in the chat with their full bios. But first we have Anand Ramaya. Um, as founder of Karma Film, Anand has built a impressive 20 year track record as a BIPOC and equity seeking producer with over 80 hours of content and over 35 awards, including five Geminis, a Canadian Screen Award, and a Kids Screen Award. Anand has written and directed numerous award winning documentaries, including Cosmic Current, Mad Cow, Sacred Cow, Who Killed Gandhi, and award winning series Landing Stories from the Cultural Divide, as well as stop motion series. Plus Bay and the film Donkey Head. Uh, next we have Teresa M. Ho. Hello, welcome. Uh, next we have Teresa M. Ho. Teresa is a producer with 100 Dragons with over 25 years of industry experience in production finance and management, including over 10 years as a producer in Canadian television. Recent TV credits include four seasons of CBC's Frankie Drake Mysteries and two seasons of Chorus's Departure. Currently, she is in post-production on the web series, Hello Again, with partners CBC Gem and Bell Fund. Hi, welcome, Teresa. Uh, and next we have Vishal Harlal. Uh, Vishal is a principal of Cinephile Accounting and, is, and has been producing, sorry, and has been working in the film and entertainment industry since 2014, helping cast and crew members with their accounting and taxation needs and building their competency in financial literacy. Vishal's purpose is to showcase social justice themes and to bring talent that has been underrepresented in the industry to the limelight and showcase their creativity, their stories, and their dreams. Welcome. And I will now pass it off to our moderator for this session, Naomi Ambrose. <clears throat> Excuse me. Naomi is building a reputation on the Vancouver creative scene as one of the most influential upcoming writers, directors, and producers. Naomi has spent the last seven years in the creative space producing notable docuseries such as Women in Management Positions, Canada and US, and with the most recent being her remarkable Lady Rising Actress Chronicles documentary. She strives to fulfill her passion to motivate and empower creative female entrepreneurs of Black, Caribbean, Canadian descent to pursue their artistic, artistic and entrepreneurial goals. Thank you so much everyone for being here today and welcome. Uh, all right, everyone. Thank you all so much for attending this event today. And thank you, Katie, for that welcome. I'm very excited to have this chat with our wonderful guests here today. So to our guests, Anand, Teresa, and Vishal, please feel free to jump in and answer any question that your heart, your soul, or your mind desires, or all three, if these be. So I'll start off with Teresa. So my first question for you all is, was there a defining moment in your life that made you say, yes, I want to be a producer? Thanks, Naomi, for that question, um, because for the longest time, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a picture editor and I wanted to be a journalist. Um, nowhere in my uh, formative years did I know what it was to be a producer. And um, this is, you know, that's the beauty of these programs is that uh, hopefully um, the exposure to people like myself and to Anon um, that people will see, hey, this is an opportunity. And um, for me, it, you know, the one thing that I have throughout my entire career, though, um, even though I, I didn't really think I'd be a producer um, for the longest time is looking for opportunities. And um, I think, you know, that's that's the thing that entrepreneurs um, and that is what we as producers who are building production companies what we are entrepreneurs always look for that opportunity so i think you know what um where i landed in uh realizing that producing was my thing was um when i was looking at opportunities to tell stories and um what i enjoy most about producing is working with people and um kind of pushing their stories and um, collaborating with creative people. And so that kind of defined my moment of when I wanted to become a producer. And then what about you? <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, I actually, my, my, when I was growing up, my father was a filmmaker on the side. 
Uh, he had a day job and then he made his own movies and sort of engaged us to sort of join in and help out because we were free labor. <laughs> um, but I, I studied commerce in uh, university. And so I thought when I started in the industry, I really wanted to figure out how to be sustainable and how to, you know, um, how to finance projects more properly, you know, uh, and to, yeah, just to be sustainable and to be on that side of the business to be able to facilitate stories getting told that I believed in and, you know, and to, um, you know, build up, uh, I think a catalog of shows that sort of represented who I was as well, you know, and to have a, have a bit of a say in that. So that was my motivation, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, for you, I would say you are a producer of sorts, but a producer of, of accounting documents, I would say. So is there a reason or what made you interested in, in becoming a, an accountant? Well, it, it's, I have a really unique story. I, I'm, I'm a chartered professional accountant by trade. Um, I've been a, an accountant, designated accountant since 2014 and accountant since 2011, but getting into the industry was, uh, was a, a big fluke. Um, I met this lady on an airplane on my way to LA. Uh, myself and a few friends, we decided to go to LA just for the weekend, to, uh, uh, a boys getaway, I guess you can say. Um, we upgraded our flights to sort of that first class cabin on WestJet, which is really just business class. Um, and I was sitting next to a guy who was uh, a lighting guy in the industry. And I was just, you know, an accountant articling at a, an accounting firm here in Vancouver. And I was looking towards what I wanted to do for the rest of my career as an accountant. And, um, you know, we spoke about what he was doing and he asked me what I did. And I said, hey, you know, I just wrote this big exam to, to be a chartered accountant. And um, this lady behind me was overhearing this conversation and she kind of piped up and said, hey, that exam that you wrote was so much easier than when I wrote it. And so I turned, I turned around and I was already like maybe two or three beer in during this flight and I said, hey, what the heck, you're, you're a chart accountant as well? And she was like, yeah. And um, she told me that she had her own film production company here in Vancouver. She was heading to LA for the Daytime Emmy Awards where she was nominated for best uh, children's television show. And uh, she essentially just told me that she was looking for someone to do her job. And uh, you know, me, two or three beer in said, hey, I'm the perfect person for you. And uh, we exchanged contact information. And a month later, she offered me a job as a controller of her production company. So that's how I got sort of into the film accounting sort of industry here for film and entertainment and um, decided to open up my own practice geared towards film professionals. So pretty interesting how, you know, our paths you know, intersect and it's just really strange sometimes how we find ourselves into, you know, being in a production company. So along those lines of interesting, you know, uh, segues and finding our footing to being coming a, a production company, um, I was wondering as well to how did you get started um, from the time you, you became, um, you decided that's the path that you wanted to get into to create your company. How did that path start off for you from building you know, from the ground. We can start with you, Vishal, and we can open up to everybody else too. Yeah, um, you know, for me it was learning the industry. Um, like all film professionals, production companies, what we do is quite different from what a normal business would operate. We have different sort of um, aspects of how we build our production companies, whether it's getting interim financing from the banks uh, based on our tax credit calculations. Tax credits are a big deal for production companies. They help finance your projects. They're crucial to help pay for your cast and crew. Um, and just sort of knowing the ins and outs of what you can do in um, making your production company viable, but also ensuring that you have enough cash to build your projects is essentially you have a company to build out your dream, build out what your what your projects are about. Um, for me, it was important to kind of understand the task credits, uh, to understand how I can assist different people and, and their projects. And once I've learned all that stuff, I kind of decided that I could do this on my own and help other people, especially those that are underrepresented. So brown, black um, people, 
people of color, indigenous, uh, the LGBTQ community, people that don't get that kind of assistance elsewhere. And that's where I come in. Now, I'm not Teresa. <laughs> Um, like Vishal, um, I came from an accounting background. No, to account. <laughs> I was uh, I was the weird one. I went to film school and then <laughs> went into accounting after. <laughs> um, but it was it was definitely one of those uh, formative uh, parts of my career where you know I came out of film school not knowing anything about money, and all I wanted to do was get a job, um, and became an assistant accountant. And from there, um, it was about 12 years worth of financial um, film school, where you learn about money, where you learn about how to track money, where you learn about where the money comes from, where the money goes, how to spend it. Um, and so in that in that 12 year period where I was a production accountant before I um, went into in house in a, a production company where I worked for other people, it was uh, it was a trust building with executives that um, I, I'm sure Vishal, you have that those relationships where I can call, you know, up banks and 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 go, okay, I have this project, I need financing, I have this track record, having worked for other people on how to take care of money, and so that's very important um, in terms of uh, having as as film is a collaborative um, medium. Uh, it, having that uh, those relationships around um, with lawyers, with banks, with um, you know film financiers who know that you you can be trusted um, with their millions. Um, yeah, I think I had a slightly different path. I um, growing up here in Saskatchewan, um, like I said, my first introduction to film was through my family, through my father's project. They were really small indie guerrilla films, so they were self-financed. He'd have one broadcast pre-sale, and then he'd remortgage the house and just put all of his cash into it. And so I had sort of some exposure to sort of alternative financing structures through him, where he accessed some of those uh, things. But there was no industry at the time. It was really kind of uh, early days. But I ended up going to a couple of markets, uh, to AFM and to NAPI and getting a taste of that. And then when I um, got out of university, finished my commerce degree, I took a job as a um, kind of an intern at a production company. It was a post-production house. There wasn't the depth of knowledge out here as there probably is in Vancouver, as there is in Vancouver and Toronto. So the company itself didn't have any experience producing their own shows. They were essentially a post-production house for you know, some other producers who were doing docs and for corporate videos and commercials. Um, and they wanted me to, you know, do a business plan for them for, for their company. And they wanted me to try and produce for them. Right. So, so I started off doing that in house. Uh, I raised the money from my own salary, <laughs> which was tiny uh, through like an IRAP grant. And I just said, let me get my foot in the door and start working. Um, and so you know, I produced some corporate stuff for them, and then I produced a, a documentary through a CETA grant. Uh, that was my first project. And, um, you know, after a while, after a couple of years, you know, my interest in content was very different from theirs. So I managed to get my first documentary financed, which was like the history of LSD research um, for a history channel. And so I just transitioned out of working for that company that had very different sort of ideas around what content they wanted to do and what I did. And I ended up staying with them, but just renting an office and then going independent that way. So I guess it was within three years, after three years of being employed, I had my first show up and um, started producing my own content. And I, I grew up in a predominantly indigenous community up in Northern Saskatchewan. And, and obviously as a South Asian person, I was interested in stories that were from my community. Um, and so I, really just naturally kind of ended up focusing on working with indigenous filmmakers and then with my own stuff and then other like uh, people from a variety of backgrounds. So kind of naturally became producing that way on a very small scale and it just grew, right? So after that, it was about facilitating a growing slate of projects that we had sort of developed. Um, yeah, 
here we are 20 years later, you know, still at it. <laughs> still at it, it's still going. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's interesting in terms for my case as well, my interest in starting my own production company, it started when I was an extra on different TV shows and, and films. I just noticed that a lot of the productions that I, I was involved in, I didn't see anybody with my, my background, with my, my Caribbean heritage, with my ethnic background. So I, I said, okay, I, I think I need to create some content. And I always had an interest in having my own business. Anyway, I come from an entrepreneurial background myself as well. And I just being the person that I am, I, I get the ball rolling and I, I started my own company. And, you know, it's been about two years ish and still learning, still growing. So, you know, learning along the way. So it's, it's very interesting, you know, to listen to everybody's story, how, you know, they, they eventually started their own company. And this also leads me into um, my other question. So considering, you know, your starting points, were there any steps that you took to help you to make sure that you were launching successfully? Anybody can uh, take that question, can start off. Um, well, I can I can say like just again because I wasn't uh, working for a bigger company <clears throat> and I was you know I didn't really have access to that depth of knowledge of original content producers like that maybe some of the other um, some other people would have had so you're you're just really trying to get stuff going and you're starting from scratch but the first thing that made me feel more sustainable and actually gave us a bit of a base was getting a series off the ground and it was a pretty small but successful stop motion animation show um, called Wapus Bay. And so we did a pilot and then that went to Sundance and then it sort of opened the door for series. And I have to say like getting a series off the ground was the first thing that really solidified the path, right? It's like you have a bit of, you know, you have a bit of financing coming through, a bit of stability, and then you can build a base around that. And so that's that was really the start, <clears throat> you know, allowed me to to hire staff and have an have a proper office and you know really uh, start to develop more projects on the side as well. So that was a key moment for me. So. Getting that first series greenlit that's always a good success indicator, right? <laughs> huge deal, huge deal. I think for me was um, really just being in the industry, um, making those connections and building a clientele that way. Um, you know, meeting as many people as you can is very important. Um, networking, you know, as, as it's been tough over the past two years now with, with the pandemic, but with things opening up, you know, I recommend definitely going out um, and, and networking. You never know who, you, who you're gonna meet, especially for my case, I met someone on an airplane. Um, that kind of opened the door for me to kind of expand sort of my knowledge base and get into an industry where there wasn't um, a film focused accountant that, you know, catered to film professionals. So that opened that door, but building a clientele is just, you know, um, meeting new people, um, you know, advertising my services um, and finding the right people that want to sort of take advantage of, of, of a resource. Teresa? Um, I, I think for me, a lot of it is um, in building a company is looking around the foundations and creating um, stable foundations into, with the people you know. Um, my big thing, and I always tell young producers when they ask um, what, what was the, the best thing I did was like, hire a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> sure you own your rights make sure you're protected and I always tell them because you know lawyers are scary right because they charge you a lot of money but um, lawyers are worth their weight in gold because they will protect you and they know um, how to protect you and all of the legal documents and all of the, the so you know I have a great lawyer um, but also looking around as to what you can do and what you can't do so I always say that um, you know, my, my background is accounting. So I can do my own accounting. Oftentimes I don't want to, but I can. Um, but I can't write contracts and I can't do post-production. And you know, so hire and build that foundation around you of the people who can supplement and um, complement your own skills. 
And I think that's that that as a building a foundation for a company is really important. So I'm hearing a lot for listeners out there as well. It seems to be the recurring themes of networking and you know, delegating tasks where you know that you're not strong in a certain area to, to find you know, someone who can complement your skills. And I'm also wondering too as well, Anand, whilst I was reading and learning about your company, I, I believe that there is also a head of development uh, so your company as well. So I was just wondering too, would you maybe suggest a successful point maybe is to either partner with somebody from earlier on, um, you know, when you're just starting off or, you know, is it better maybe for you to start on your own and then, you know, later on, if you realize, oh, you know what, I can't maybe do this or just, um, you know, figuring out maybe how, how do you went about deciding from the beginning if you partner or try first and then bring somebody else in. Yeah, I mean, it's in our case, it uh, it sort of happened really naturally. Like we uh, had a job open up, and so Kelly Kelly Ballone, who's my producing partner now, um, he started with me about twelve years ago, and he came in, and I had a job for him at that time. So he worked for for me, and that in that respect for for a few years on the series, right? And we got to get into a workflow of you know, okay, well, he's very strong in development, right? So he was helping lead that charge. And one of the things that's also very important I want to mention is that you have to keep developing even when you're in production, because what happened to us is that you get caught with your pants down, right? Like you're, you're pouring everything you have into making the show that you're making, and then you come out of it. And then you're like, oh my God, what do I do next? How do I keep this going and keep the ship floating? And that was when we realized as we were working together, doing everything um, that, you know, you know, having a title and also an area of focus where if there's two of you, you know, one person can always keep that cycle of development flowing. Right. And 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 that's just critical because you don't want to end up, you know, pouring your heart and soul into something for two years or whatever it is and then. And then you don't have any income, no, no, nothing happening the next year, right? So then all of a sudden you've got a gap and um, that can really shut you down fast. <laughs> so yeah, it's been great to be able to work so closely with someone that I trust. And now we're producing partners who's not uh, just the director of development anymore. So it's worked out good in our, in our case, so yeah. Awesome. In, with regards to having your pants got down, not literally, obviously, but more of thinking along the lines of the challenges. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> the challenges for the that, imagery there, but. <laughs> <laughs> but more along the lines of the challenges that you might have encountered. Do any of you mind sharing some of the, the first set of challenges that you encountered when you just started your company and how you overcame those challenges? I don't think we have enough time for that, do we? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna say, like, uh, how how long is this string? <laughs> <laughs> It'd be one or two, you know, that really stood out for you, and you think our audience could, could learn it from. Um, I, I I think for me, because you know, as I said, uh, I could do my own accounting. It's also knowing your limitations, right? That's the that's the biggest um, in terms of. Uh, what challenges to overcome. You might feel you can do everything, but you probably don't have the time to do everything. So um, look around you in your network who, who can help you and understand your own limitations. I agree with Teresa. Um, my clients that have their own production companies, they're uh, you know, sole shareholders of their production companies, they try to do everything. Um, and it's easy to get kind of stuck in that because it's your own company and you want to have that control. Um, you want to ensure that everything that's going in, you know about and everything that's going out, you know about. So my recommendation is, you know, to know, know your limitations, know what you can do the best. Um, prioritize doing what you do best as number one and then everything else kind of delegate find people that you can trust, find people that you can um, kind of pass work on so they can focus on that while you practice, you do something, you, you're working on something that you know that's gonna be, um, that's gonna fulfill what you're, 
what you're doing. And, and that's where you want your production company or your company to kind of grow because you, you set up your production company focused on, on your ideas. You know, you don't want to be boggled down by, you know, contracts or the accounting or, or whatever. You want to focus on create. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think like along that line, but slightly different point to make too is that I, uh, as a young producer, found myself out there, you know, trying to sort of gain some wisdom from people around me, and um, you know, and everyone has their own style, but for me, I found that when I was pitching projects that I wasn't in love with, I didn't get anywhere. And some people can, right? Some bigger producers can go in and they'll just it's a market driven approach, and they have that track record. But as a newcomer, uh, you know, a person of color from the regions without a lot of experience, you know, it's like you really want to key in on what kinds of projects are people going to accept you as the right person to make, right, to produce. And so in a way, it's sort of building your brand at an early stage and building relationships with people so they know who you are and what you're about. Uh, and then also finding the right kind of projects where people can take a chance on you, right? Because if you go in pitching Game of Thrones and you're like, you have no experience, it's like, <laughs> no one's going to finance you, right? Uh, it's like, so I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you, you know, that many millions of dollars to start your career and take a chance. Um, but if they know you're passionate and you've done your homework and you have a good team, you know, that's the other thing is partnering up. And I still do it. And I feel like I try to surround myself with people who are smarter than me which is not that hard, um, you know? And so you just partner up with people in terms of filmmakers, in terms of writers, in terms of exec producers and have the right kind of project that you can pitch where people go, yeah, I wanna take a chance on this guy or this person. And I believe that they will make the kind of show that's uniquely theirs. Uh, and then you have a chance to build on that, right? Cause if you're not selling, you're not in business. So none of the other stuff matters, right? Like once you have a sale, then you've got a project and you also need to do what Teresa and uh, Vishal are talking about, which is have a strong base uh, in, in the office, you know? But yeah, if you can't convince people to finance your project, then you're kind of, you know. Anyway, that's a tricky thing. That was what I struggled with in the beginning and sort of getting more refined about that. And, and uh, now 20 years later, I feel like it's a bit easier, but still hard. <laughs> I just want to just yeah. further to that, Anon, is that, you know, as you're saying, you got to find projects you're passionate about. And, and um, if you're, there's a lot of rejection in this industry, right? Yeah. There's a lot of no's you have to get through before you get a yes. Um, so if, if you're not passionate about the project um, that you're selling and you're pitching, um, people can tell and they can feed on that energy and they'll, they'll find the no's. Um, it's, you know, they only need one no. Um, so it, it helps you to really believe in your project to develop that thick skin when the no's come so that you eventually you'll find that yes. Yeah, great advice guys. And just in terms of, you know, you know, plodding along and, you know, being passionate, did you all decide to focus on a particular niche or did your interests grow over time? What was that process like for you finding your niche or your genres that you specialize in? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have to say that's actually one of the things that's been a real challenge for me because I, I've been filmmaker focused and uh, the filmmakers have taken me into different genres, right? So I was always, cause I grew up where my father was a filmmaker. And so I just felt like that was a natural thing for me was to work with developing and, and sort of, you know, pushing forward the vision of these people, right? And, and also some of my ideas, but so I've been working in animation and documentary and in drama now, finally, right? So, uh, but I do think that it's hard to do that. And I would say to be smart, if you can find a niche, uh, I would say, you know, stick to it, build your base, even spend, give yourself five years or 10 years even, and just build a solid foundation for your company. Cause uh, the way that I've approached things has been very organic and it's hard to hit all the markets to stay in the loop with all the different genres all the time. It takes a lot of 
gets a lot of bouncing, right? So probably I'd be making a lot more money right now if I'd done that. <laughs> thing, right? So following this perhaps too much, but <laughs> yeah. What about you, Teresa? <laughs> um, in terms of niche, I, I, I don't know that um, I focus on a niche um, except for people. Um, my projects that I gravitate towards and find passion in are particularly um, character driven, whether it be documentary, whether it be short films, whether it be um, features or uh, television series. I like the I like to understand and see people. Um, and so what I also enjoy is the diversity of people. Um, and so, you know, this is this is where um, if we're going to call it a niche, it's it's that I like to see all people represented in um, in dramas and and documentaries and and whatever kind of storytelling um, that that I will back and find passion for. So that that's yeah, quite. <laughs> well, it's, well, it's, it's, yep. Go ahead. Go ahead, Nadia. Yeah. I was gonna, I was gonna say, and I think that's, I share that sort of mindset with you, Teresa, is that, you know, it's, and it's easy to stay passionate that way too, right? Because you find people and stories that you really believe in. And sometimes it means you are working in different genres, but that, that's, that I, sh I share that common sort of focus. If there were one thing that was a focus of my work, it's to sort of, you know, find uh, people with unique stories to tell. Mm -hmm. um, so we try my best to do that, you know. Yeah, same with me too as well. I have a wide range of interests and you know different genres. I, I think for me, my passion has always been with fiction, and so I found myself when I started off writing a lot of you know fiction stories. I started off by writing some short stories, and I'm branching now more to doing you know drama podcasts. And I obviously I, I envision having an action movie. Yes, way down the line. Hopefully, I don't know if The Rock, if he's watching. Anyway, <laughs> who knows if The Rock's going to be on? But I digress. But that's, you know, it's, it's, it's really tricky. Yeah, to, it's really fine to stick down to a niche if you have a wide range of interests. But I, I think when you're just starting off, maybe it does help to focus on, on one area. And then, you know, as Anand was saying, you know, you build, you build your, your base from there. And then maybe eventually down the line, you can focus on other areas as well. I'm just curious for you, Vishal. I know you're you're into accounting. If you ever curious about, you know, being a producer yourself, changing your niche, or are you sticking solely <laughs> to accounting? Well, um, that's sort of my goal is to kind of expand. So um, to produce my own projects. Um, you know, I've been very lucky to be exposed to different sort of genres myself, being in the film industry since 2014. Um, starting out, you know, I've I've worked on, you know. Disney XD projects, um, movies of the week for Lifetime and Hallmark, and and seeing sort of the sort of the business plan of how those work. Um, you know, Hallmark movies are money makers. They, you know, if you can produce a Hallmark movie and if you're able to write a cookie cutter script and sell that, you know, you're making money, and that's a way sort of to sustain your own passion project. Um, you know, it's it's easier said than done, but if you can find a way to gain the experience and and write one of those or produce one of those projects, you can use the funds from that to help finance your own passion project. If you can do both, that's fantastic. Um, a lot of my clients are doing documentaries, so I'm getting exposed to that. I'm part of the board for Doc DC, um, so from going from what I'm just saying, if you if you're able to kind of expose yourself to different genres and kind of figure out the business side of things and um, to way to kind of get in there and, and and get on a project that is kind of the cookie cutter sort of thing and learn how to do those. And if you can sell something, you can finance your own projects. And that's kind of like the goal for everyone. Thanks, Michelle. Oh, go ahead, I agree with Michelle in that too, because I also line produce. Um, so, you know, I, I will take on the large projects like the Frankie Drakes and, and the departures and, and, um, and work freelance so that the other six months of the year, I can take that break and work on development. 
And, but what it also affords me to do when I am working on the larger projects that I'm working for somebody else is that it, that network is so important. Um, those, those people who want to, you know, who may be working in props and want to do something else or who are set decorators and have different ambitions, meeting those people. And then, um, you know, even on Hello Again, the web series, um, I'm in the middle of post-production, we elevated a lot of people who I knew from the larger shows into key roles in order to um, help them elevate themselves as well as um, boost up uh, new talent as, uh, to to in in new positions. So it's it's so important to meet people um, by even going to work for a Disney or working for Hallmark. Um, and you learn that you we're all in this to tell stories, and and that's the beauty. Thank you, guys. Um, and the final question before we move on to our audience questions, are there any resources, any legal resources or any startup funding resources that you would suggest for any aspiring producers to pursue or to look into? Um, there's always the, well, the there are a number of resources. I think the Academy has a list um, on their website that I started looking into. Um, the most recent one that just uh, was uh, the Bell Fund development slate that just had a, a, a deadline. But I think you can go through and look for development. Um, and I, I'm constantly on different websites looking for development funding. Yeah, yeah you're, you know, the Bell Fund and your provincial, um, you know, media agency, whether it's, you know, Ontario Creates or Creative Saskatchewan or uh, Creative BC, um, those are all good places to start too. And they can also become champions for you as a company. And if there are training opportunities, the National Screen Institute, again, not like financial resources, but they have some great programs to help people like us get developed. And even now, like even mid-stage career, I'm still finding opportunities through those organizations to up my game, right? Uh, which is all part of it. And yeah. Yeah, but development financing, <laughs> that's important, right? To keep, keep, keep that flowing through, so, yeah. Yeah, there's uh, numerous programs, CMF, uh, the CMPA, your local provincial um, uh, creative bodies, uh, NBC's Creative BC, um, your local provincial arts councils, like for example, BC, BC Arts Council or the Canada Arts Council. Um, there's a lot of funding that they're, out there you just have to do your research you have to look into it um, if you are creating a production company uh, definitely have any funding being funneled to your production company rather to yourself as an individual because they will provide you with the t4a tax slip if you are getting that money as an individual you will be taxed on that funding so that's a little caveat to kind of um, look into uh, when you're applying for funding to make sure that if you want a production company, get that funding through your production company so your production company can be taxed on that rather than yourself as an individual. Yeah. And, and one other resource I wanted to mention too is a, a human, human resource, right? It's like executive producers. Really successful executive producers are often extremely generous and hyper-intelligent, high-functioning people who like helping, you know, emerging producers, especially if you're genuine. And, uh, you know, and I've been very fortunate to be able to make those phone calls and, you know, someone will take time to have a chat with you to help you with your project or with your plan um, and or have a coffee or a drink at a market, you know, those kinds of things to have access to people, you know, like Teresa or Vishal or whoever uh, and, and other, you know, some of the really big producers in the country. That's always it's inspiring, but it's also really practical knowledge that you can tap usually for free. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing. Let's open up to questions from the audience. And thank you to our audience for your wonderful and insightful questions. So our first question that we have is from Ian Ma. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. It's from Brain Puddle Production. And Ian asks, can you talk about benefits and pitfalls of outsourcing versus hiring and building in-house teams for things like effects, sound, etc. 
Anyone to take it, that question? Um, one of the things that I learned in my early career, and this was something that was um, um, given to me as a buzzword, but it, it really has um, helped me um, figure out when to outsource and, and, and when to hire is um, strategic alliances. Um, you know, strategic alliances are important because um, you're you're trying to create a product that some people have that have many different um, avenues to funnel into one. And uh, if you can find um, the companies that you work well with and strategically partner, whether it um, if you have a smaller budget and you need uh, uh, visual effects and you find another visual effects house that is emerging and you can work together um, with the budgets, that helps because now you, you've got a common goal. They wanna build their company, you wanna build your company. Um, and this is where the lawyers come in because your lawyer will then help you with um, the understanding of how their help will help you with the project. Um, what is what uh, you know? Deal memos and that kind of thing. Um, and and if they want a piece of it because they have the, it's it's they're doing so much work at a lower rate. Again, those are conversations to have with your lawyer um, of to protect your rights and what it is you're giving away. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, we, we function, um, again, with that question, like we're typically, we're working with different filmmakers in different genres all the time. And I found that for us, it's never been um, really the path to hire in-house creatives and technical staff, uh, not, not at any expanded level, because you end up wanting to create the right team for every project, right? And that's those decisions in my world at least happen in conjunction with the filmmaker, right? And so I, I might, like my brother's a composer and I use him a lot, like whenever I can, but I can't impose that on other people. I wouldn't feel right about it. Uh, and so, you know, we always go out and see who the right composer is for that project, who the, who's the right sound editor. Um, and so keeping that flexibility is also another way to go, right? To just decide, but build those strategic relationships and perhaps not with, some with companies like post-production houses for sure, uh, but then also with different, you know, people who are really good at their jobs, right? And, uh, you know, keeping them close to you and building the relationships so you can have a stable of really talented people and find the right fit for each show, right? That, that's how we do it, so. All right, next question. Aside from a lawyer and accountant, what other non-creative roles do you think are crucial when creating a production company? I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> business affairs, right? It's like you guys are both business, uh, very strong in business, you know, in that side. But it's like we had brought in a successful business affairs person from a larger company and they did a workshop with us. And they built a template for us on how to approach business affairs, you know, with a rock solid uh, structure and checklist and that just set the path, right? So I think that's super important for people, you know, figure it out and then, yeah, train somebody to handle it for you or, or get somebody good, super important. I agree with Anand there. Um, if you can find a, a quality business affairs professional, um, that's amazing. They're very hard to come by. Um, a lot of my clients here in BC, they're desperate, desperately looking for business affairs people. I try to do my best. Um, a business affairs person is essentially a combination of a lawyer and accountant together because they understand all the contracts and sort of the, the tax credit applications. So very tough to come by. And um, hopefully there is a program in the future that will help kind of train future business affairs people. I would also add administrators, right? Because things like writing up credits, screen credits, that's really labor intensive. <laughs> um, putting in applications together that you're, you know, yes, you, you've got, but like gathering all the little bits and pieces to put that application together. Um, you don't want to pay your, your $800 an hour lawyer to do that. Um, 
higher. So oftentimes I actually have um, access to the CMPA mentors, the mentorship program, um, people to mentor who want to learn how to produce. And so you um, hire them and you'll just show them, okay, well, this is from beginning to end, this is the, the lifespan of a production and um, come help me. Thank you. Next question. Let's say we are producers with a vast slate of projects in development. How do we raise financing for the entrepreneurial side of the company and not only per project? That's a great question, yeah. And then I'll let you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> so what is, what is the, what is the question? I mean, they're very lucky because that's very, very unusual. Um, so if they have corporate, you know, financing, I'd say you're in a very small minority of people who get that, right? So I, I don't know what to say. I'm I'm jealous. <laughs> well, I mean that that's the that's the other part of it, right? Is tax credits are um, what a producer kind of the that extra ten percent helps us finance the the rest of our our lifespan. Um, so if you can have multiple projects that have that extra 10%, that's what it, it helps us do. Um, the other thing is, as you were saying, Anand, uh, that you had um, your first breakthrough was with your first series, is like protect your producer fees and overhead. Um, that will keep, you know, if you've got that one pr production, don't give those up for the sake of getting it made because then that's just one project you need as you were saying, a non a slate. Thank you. Okay, so this, how do you say Anand? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, this question specifically for Anand and Teresa. You brought up raising money for your first ventures. How does a new production company with limited capital raise money for their projects? Where does that money come from, particularly in the Canadian ecosystem? How much of it is private investor money and how much of it is grants? Um, well, it's, you know, I think for Canadian television, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, well, it's not easy, but you have to make a pre-sale to a Canadian broadcaster first. And then that triggers off all of the different funds that are available in Canada, like the Canada Media Fund, the provincial and federal tax credits, and then the specific private funds or TV funds that are out there like Rogers and Shaw Rocket Fund and whatever else is available. So that's a typical TV financing structure. And then films are similar, but it's Telefilm Canada. And then, you know, some of those other funds as well and tax credits. So that's, does that answer the question? Anything to add there? Yeah, private, believe, private yeah. financing yeah. part to, Private investment, like from individuals, is is difficult to access. Uh, again, I, I feel like it's a you know it's based on producer confidence, their confidence in you, and then the saleability of your project. So, you know, those are uh, tough things to sort of convince people to part with money. Um, but if you can develop those relationships, that's also really really good to have access to. So is there anything I'd like to comment on that? No, I, I think Anand covered it. Covered it all. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm wondering too, just in terms of the private investment, I'm wondering if maybe it might be the, the question might have been referring to maybe crowdfunding. Um, you know, the crowdfunding platforms. I wondered if that's a possible angle. I, um, I think I think when you're talking about the private investors, um, the model is a little different. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it, it's something that if you are looking to get broadcasters and um, uh, and tax credits and that kind of thing, you have to be wary of your private investors um, because there are rules. And again, this is where strong business affairs, strong lawyers help you and protect you um, that you're not you're not. Uh, you're not jeopardizing one piece of the pie um, by doing something to raise money for the other piece of the pie. It's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a tangled web, I think. Thank you. Next question. Can you talk about some of the sacrifices you've had to make to get where you are today, specifically personal sacrifices? Have relationships suffered because of how intense the work is and how have you navigated that work-life balance? 
Teresa, I see you laughing. <laughs> work life? There's a life? What? <laughs> yeah. Say what? Uh, what you take this with? You can ask my son. <laughs> Defer it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, it's hard, right? It's hard to be married to filmmakers. It's hard to have a person in your family who does what we do because when you're in production, you're really inaccessible. Um, so yeah, I think there's always sacrifice, but you know, on the other side of it too, I think if your children and your, the people around you that love you can see that you're doing something that you believe in and that you're, you know, uh, it's a balance. It's not easy, right? It's like a very, very tough industry on family for sure. Right. So we all deal with those outcomes <laughs> as they come. So I don't know what the answer is. Honestly, I don't have any hobbies. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to have have hobbies when your your career is your hobby right no, like there you go exactly that's the other yeah, thing yeah, yeah. If you're, <laughs> and you're, you're, you hit it on the on the head is that um if you're passionate about what you're doing then you just have to surround with people who you love who understand that and to be honest my my son who is 21 now um he wants to actually be in the industry and so I guess it's not so bad. He didn't like completely get scared off that mom, you know, goes off and works 14 hour days, although he wants to be in post-production, not production. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's probably, that's, you know, it's great. They can get acquainted enough with the industry to know, oh, well, this is the lifestyle associated to different uh, facets of, of the work that we do, right? So mm -hmm. that's also a good thing. Mine are still young, so they're, they're starting to they 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 think it's cool and my my their uncle's a musician and I do this and so they're you know accustomed to alternative industry creative industry people but um yeah it's just tough you just gotta find people you know yeah like I said I think it's important for people to know that you're passionate about your work and uh and that it just comes with the territory right that it's just going to be an alternative type of life you know I think we might have time for one more question. Do you create single use corporations for specific projects? Uh, when do you decide to do that? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, if you have a project that's greenlit and you're ready to uh, produce, um, it's best to use uh, sort of a new production company um, in, for the sake of you know, uh, task credits. Um, task credit estimations to keep things clean, to keep your corporate file clean and your corporate tax return clean. Um, I definitely recommend it. I also definitely recommend having a company just for development. And so you house all your development funding in one development company. Um, but yeah, I think it's the right, right way to go about things. Yeah, we, we do, we have single, like Karma Film is essentially a development corporation, right? It's, it's a company just for development. None of our productions flow through there at all. Uh, every every single project has its own single purpose entity. It's it limits the liability to that company. Um, there's just that's just the way you do it, right? At least here, in my in my experience, for the most part. So. And I always ask my lawyers and my accountants, when do we? <laughs> When's the right time? You know, right. they know. They know. And oftentimes, you know, even like creating your own another single purpose company, it is tax credits that drive that. Um, and when you want to get, especially mm -hmm. for the larger pr productions, um, if you're, you know, looking at um, uh, three, five million dollars worth of tax credits, you want to be able to get it at the right time um, to pay your bank back. Okay, well, thank you all so much for your insightful questions and to our panelists for your insightful answers. I will hand it back over to Katie. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much. Um, thanks so much, Naomi, for leading that conversation and really want to thank um, Anand, Teresa, Michelle, and Naomi for today's conversation and for all of their prep work and sharing their insight with us because that was really great. Um, another thank you to our partners at the Canadian Media Producers Association for presenting this session today. 